Hello. I'm here to talk to you today about death. My death, possibly your death. Now, I don't know how long I'll live. Uh, if I keep doing this, I, I won't see 70, but not see 60. Okay, I'm 49. But, uh, and if you compare pictures of me from two years ago to pictures of me now, you'll see that I look considerably different. I look healthier two years ago than I do now. But, uh, so just go through my videos and you'll see what I mean. But, um, that said, I continue to smoke. But, um, death. You see, we don't know when we're going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die. But what I do know is that there's more than one type of death. There's also the death of homeless advocacy, which I have seen coming for a while. For, I would say, at least three years. Ever since uh, Michael Stoops, the great homeless advocate, had a, a major stroke in June 2015. And he passed away in May of 2017. Uh, and... I've thought about the death of homeless advocacy and now as DC's mayor Muriel Bowser runs for re-election I see that if she wins a second term then she will make all of the work of the paid advocates in the nonprofits as well as the unpaid freelance advocates like myself to no effect uh, her administration as well as other administrations have done things to make it harder and harder for us advocates to get any concessions from government. And uh, my Marxist friends would say that that's the way of all capitalism these days, that capitalism as a whole is making it where there are less and less concessions. Uh, some would even say that there are no concessions left, that government doesn't feel like they're backed against the wall at all anymore by those who speak up for working class people. Uh, so, I tried to ensure that Bowser wouldn't become, or wouldn't win a second term as DC mayor by seeing if I could run. Uh, that hasn't gone well. Uh, but maybe I can still encourage enough people to vote against her. Uh, I don't care who else is out there. Uh, I do know that we don't need her for a second term. I do know that if we get her for a second term, we're, we're gonna get more of what we've already gotten. And uh, that's not good. Uh, she's made various efforts to expedite gentrification and to shut down the advocates. And uh, I've made the grave mistake as an advocate of not teaching enough of my tactics to other people soon enough. So that if the one of me gets brought down, then that alone won't kill advocacy, but it will take away one of government's harshest critics. And uh, so, it, it, and it will lower the uh, narrative to a lesser degree. Uh, the advocates won't have as much strong narrative as they've had uh, with me in the game. But anyway, uh, then there's societal death. You see, people are at a place now where no matter what information you present to them, no matter how right you are, that information oftentimes is not well received and I remember reading an article a few years ago about a study that was done wherein it was determined that a higher percentage of American women are overweight now because housework is not as labor intensive as it used to be and I thought about how stupid it was to even do that study because the information would not be well received. Uh, 
in August of 2018, I read an article about a study that was called off. This study would have looked at whether or not it's health healthy for a person to drink one or two alcoholic drinks a day. And it was determined that there was no point in doing the study, that there is no compelling reason to tell those who don't drink at all to start drinking one or two drinks a day because it's healthier for their heart. Uh, there's no compelling reason to do this study just to tell people who drink more, three or more drinks a day that they should drink less because they're probably not going to listen. Uh, so they didn't do the study. So, uh, you know, before you do any study, you should ask yourself, will this information be well received? Uh, what, if anything, can come of this study and publishing this, this information? And if nothing good can come of it, then don't do it. But on the other hand, when the information that you receive can be used to prevent a problem like 9-11, then you should use that information so that you don't do like Bush did in 2004, putting together a 9-11 commission to study what went wrong during the lead up to the terrorist attacks of 2001. Uh, and I find myself warning people about the CCNV shelter and how that when the capital crossing development, which is going up across the road, is done, possibly as early as 2023, then the shelter will likely be history. I tell people that by the end of 2022, the shelter will likely be closed. I also tell them that what's happening with the CCNV shelter uh, is emblematic of so many governmental problems. The shelter was created in the mid 80s. It's just over 30 years old. Uh, it, it was created by the Reagan administration and then the building was handed off to the city uh, in 2016 because they kept the 30-year covenant and they served the homeless from that building for 30 years uh, and so now the city owns it and they can do what they want with it and they can shut it down if they choose to um, so these different things are all coming together to create a recipe for shutting the shelter down within the next four years and then if the city overreacts to the occasional act of violence in or near the shelter then they might shut it down sooner than 2022 but i would argue that uh these acts of violence are not completely unprovoked people tend to argue and then uh resort to violence and it doesn't happen an awful lot but uh, there are a few high-profile cases. Um, and, and so you're safe if you don't argue with anybody. It's not like you have to worry that somebody's gonna come up behind you for no apparent reason and smash you in the head. That kind of, that kind of violence is not happening in or near the shelter. But uh, anyway, I lament the fact that we're at a place in society where we only learn in hindsight. Uh, we don't look at the indicators pointing to a catastrophe and we don't preempt that catastrophe the way that we should. Uh, and so I'm at a place now where my advocacy is defined by just trying to find a catastrophe and and get as much mileage out of it as I can by saying, hey, look, you know, we had all these precursors. We didn't pay attention. Look what happened. Now let's pay attention to this other set of precursors leading to another catastrophe. And let's preempt that catastrophe before it occurs. And sometimes people still don't listen. Uh, but also, like I began to say earlier, that the story of the CCNV shelter, the Community for Creative Nonviolence, uh, is one of multiple government failures. There, there are so many failures coming together with that shelter having been there for over 30 years. You know, we didn't take enough action over the years to uh, draw down the, the number of homeless people and to uh, preempt people's homelessness and to figure out uh, how to prevent 
homelessness. Uh, we have an agency here in DC called the Community Partnership for the Prevention of Homelessness, which is actually a misnomer. Uh, they're, they're basically a clearinghouse for the funding that government gives for uh, various homeless services, shelters and soup kitchens and uh, vans to transport people to shelter and so forth and so on. Uh, they do contract enforcement and, and uh, they don't prevent homelessness much, if at all, uh, thus the misnomer. But uh, anyway, we're, we're, we're leading as the caboose, you know, from the back of the train. And I hate that that's the truth, but it is, and it's a truth I'm going to have to live with for a, a, a while, and I have to learn how to navigate that truth and just uh, harp about the past catastrophes and the precursors that we ignored, and then hopefully use that to prevent a bigger catastrophe. So, so uh, that's just kind of where things are at, and I'll stop there.